If for those of you that haven't met me before, my name is Pete Zapool. I'm the CTO here at 1150 Academy. I would here actually, I'm going to drop my LinkedIn uh, into the chat just in case anybody in here hasn't connected with me yet. I sure would love it if you would. I always like to see how everybody's journey goes from start to finish and make myself available to chat. So if you're interested, find me on there and drop me a line. But this morning, we have the honor of having Ari Rahimsada here to do a debugging workshop for us. Ari is a developer, an architect, a teacher, an author, public speaker. I think you've done some co-founding of some engineering meetups, Ari, and, and uh, are the president of one or two of those. And, and actually, I have a fun little tidbit of information is he was also the former uh, director of consulting for an organization that had an affiliation with EFA. So he's familiar with our academy, really supports our mission. And I'm excited to have him here this morning to do this debugging workshop for everybody. So I'm going to stop yapping and turn it over to you, <laughs> Ari. And, and I am old school EFA, like crazy old school EFA. So back at... Um, 1150 Consulting, I was employee number one, and I think I was the second instructor. So uh, first we had an iOS instructor, and then I was the .NET instructor. This is back in the day when it ran out of Scott's mansion. And, and then I remember teaching in that really cold room all the way on the, on the south end of the of the house and like it was like single paned because it, it was the old part of their house and it was all like wood floor and then like single pane glass along the sides and then a sunroom all the way in the the the, the, the southmost end which of course was also like single pane glass so it was just cold hitting you from all sides <laughs> so um no one fell asleep though Huh? I, mean, you, I mean, I think the cold might have kept people up. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, we were, we were all happy like when lunch would come. <laughs> I'd drink like eight cups of coffee a day to stay warm. Uh, and then you got your new digs and now you've got even newer digs. And now the digs don't even matter. It's all Zoom. <laughs> so anyway, hi, I'm Ari. Um, let me, I'm going to go ahead and start my little presentation. I am not one to read from slides, but slides are good. Let's see here. I gotta find. I'm always in teams. All right, share screen. And can I share just PowerPoint? Let's see. I'll just share screen one. That'll be good enough. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Sure can. Sweet. Uh, so Pete came to me uh, a few weeks ago and we were talking about uh, things that I always thought would be interesting for um, students learning to code uh, to learn. And, you know, what are the gaps there? So a, a little bit about me. Um, my name is Ari Rahimzada. Uh, I'm the director of software engineering for Klipsch. I don't know if anyone here has heard of Klipsch, but it's the, uh, the audio company. Um, used to, uh, now it's Ruoff Home Mortgage over there, but, you know, where Deer Creek Music Center used to be, it used to be called Clips Music Center. Um, so I manage software across a lot of different uh, disciplines, firmware, uh, hardware, and of course, mobile development and web. So you kind of see it all. And I've been doing this a long time and you know, had a lot of interns <laughs> um, and hired a lot of people. And you know, hopefully some of my experience will help you along your career path. Uh, I will try to monitor uh, some of the chat. Let me see if I can make sure I keep that chat window open. Oh, there we go. Yeah, great speakers. Yay. I'm glad you like it. Um, if, if you end up getting the, uh, the Clips Connect app, I kind of took over that project last year. Uh, so we've been making it better. So um, I won't go into all the details, but we've, we've doubled the star rating and very excited because now we're listening to our customers you know, wholeheartedly and, and putting their feedback in there. Um, 
So I'm so glad that you like our products. I, I actually have, woo, I don't know which clip your clips, your pods uh, you got. You probably have the tier, the T5. I got the early, early on ones. Probably oh, is it the, the T5 true wireless? Yeah. Oh, okay. Have you had issues updating them? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. I would love, I would love to talk with you then because I'm trying to figure out like what issues people are running into. Because the yeah. T5 Series 1 is the first true wireless uh, that we did. And yeah, the update process, uh, not so great. Not so great. Um, it sucks. Yeah, that's what I mean. Uh, and we're working really hard to make that better. <laughs> it's just, you know, you would think, well, hey, you know, you guys own the, the product. It should be easy. And no, it's not, you know. <laughs> so you want to talk about debugging, try figuring out, the library that has uh, firmware update issues, the firmware itself, the various vendors that are involved and in finding out, okay, is it one or multiple points that have an issue with an update process? Uh, and we'll get into some of the things that I think about when I'm debugging. Um, I've been writing, just give you an idea of how long I've been writing code. I've been doing it since I was eight. Um, and I seriously was writing code when I was eight, not just like, oh, wow, computers are cool. Uh, I tried like writing some uh, random like number guessing games. I would put them on discs and then I would hand them to people. And it was back then we had things called shareware. Like these days we have freemium and premium and all those things. But back then it was just like shareware. That was like all you called it. It was either a public domain or a shareware. Uh, I could go on and on about the 80s. Uh, but then uh, I didn't want to be a software engineer because I thought software engineering uh, was just a bunch of really overweight people sitting in a dark room eating pizza. And I wanted to live past 30. Uh, and then I realized, oh, wait, that's not it. That's just 80s movies making fun of developers. I could make this a career. Um, and so then, and then I did it. <laughs> but yeah, actually it was, it was stereotypes that uh, kind of kept me out of really going gung-ho about being a programmer. I wanted to do something with computers but not necessarily programming just because of how it was uh, um, depicted in all the, the, the shows I watched. But I still found it fun. I just didn't know, you know, if it was a thing you do, you know, full time, but now I do. So anyway, um, cool. So enough about Klipsch, although I'm happy to talk about that. Um, let's see. All right, let's see if, uh, oh yeah. Oh, okay, so there. Hi, I've already introduced myself. Um, a few takeaways before we get started. Uh, number one, you're in a, a, a coding academy, but code is the easy part. Code is the easiest part of your job. And then it breaks. <laughs> and it might not be your code that breaks, it could be somebody else's code. So debugging and planning are going to be your top skills. And I, I kind of liken it to code is just an expression of your intent. So code is like English. You, you can read and speak English, but writing a book is your debugging and planning. Your ability to form sentences and paragraphs is debugging and planning. So we're going to take a we're gonna have two parts to this presentation. Uh, number one, just uh, pointers and thoughts and tips on debugging. Um, I have no problem with everyone asking questions. Uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time, uh, but there'll be plenty of time for that in our fireside chat. That, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't ask. So if there's something that I'm talking about on one of these slides, um, stop and ask or put it in the chat uh, that might be better just because it looks like we have like 40 people on. Uh, so uh, people talking over each other might be rough. Uh, so just go ahead and put it in the chat and I'll see it. I've got three monitors. <laughs> so my, my presentations uh, in my center monitor and I have the chat over on the right. So I will from time to time go look at that and I'll answer your questions. So uh, part one, thoughts. Part two, fireside chat. Um, and... I, I did ask ahead of this, if you have any uh, 
problems you're trying to work your way through right now, whether it be a class project um, or something you're doing on your own, uh, I'd love to help um, and see if we can do uh, some live debugging. I will go and play around with um, showing you some of these uh, technologies on my own environment. But uh, sometimes it's fun just to see like, hey, you know, if I was just thrown into your project and I knew nothing about it, what, what would be the first thing I do? And that's something you're gonna have to do as developers. Uh, something's gonna come out of left field and you're gonna be like, what? <laughs> yeah. So a few types of bugs. Uh, when, when you get to your first coding job, and I know 1150 simulates this, uh, there's a few different types of bugs, but it really boils down to what's the priority and responding with the appropriate urgency. Chances are you're not just gonna have one bug. Chances are you're gonna have a backlog of bugs. So how do you prioritize that? And I'm not gonna go over scrum and sprints, et cetera, during this conversation. But if you'd like to ask questions about that, I'm happy to. We use, uh, we use sprints and agile over at Klipsch. Um, we're scrummy. We don't follow scrum to the T. Uh, I've rarely met anyone who does, but if you wanna talk about agile development, scrum, and sprints and what does that look like? I am happy to walk you through that. It's, it's very cool. But here's the thing, when it comes to types of bugs, you need to know your bug types so that you can respond with urgency. Um, so number one is gonna be the things that come out of left field and that's your immediate fix and critical priority. It's costing us money or customers. That's the way it is. I, you, code is one thing, effect on the business is another. And most of the time you're dealing with business needs. And it's, there, there's, I could go on and on about it, but it's high, higher efficiency, lower cost, et cetera. But anything that affects the business tends to bubble all the way to the top. And even bugs that you know about that are causing crashes, if they're not affecting the business and there's a higher business priority, the business priority will often take precedence over the crash. Um, if you have a team of multiple people, uh, you won't really have, I, you'll be able to spread it out more, but if it's just you, and sometimes you will be the only developer on a project or one of a, maybe three developers, uh, that's, that's how you need to prioritize those things. Uh, so yeah, number one, if it's if it's costing us money or it's costing us customers or it's causing our rating to tank it's going to be immediate fix critical priority uh also the system is down like it's not responding at all yeah or parts of the system are no longer responding or broken or we're losing data those are going to be immediate fix critical priority you've probably heard of backlogs where all of your bugs are in one nice organized uh, list. When these things come in, everything stops. And sometimes people will move them all the way to the top of the backlog. Other times they won't. But make sure that you watch out for these because <laughs> you want to be able to respond to them immediately. And you want the perception to be that you will respond to these things appropriately. Uh, highest priority is you're back to the backlog. If we have no criticals like above, highest priority is what you're supposed to be working on. But highest priority does not necessarily mean it's the priority that's put in the ticket. So keep in mind when, when you get your first programming job, the highest priority items tend to be the items that are the highest up on the backlog. So try not to be so literal when you get uh, your first job, you'll see a list of items and some of them will say they're high priority. Some will say medium. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you, you would say that they're all highest priority until you have to allocate resources to them, right? <laughs> um, but that's that's true, Matt. So hopefully it's Matt and I didn't enter, uh, offend you by calling you Matt instead of Matthew. 
Um, so keep that in mind. Yeah, you know, look at that list. And when you get to your first job, ask a question about, hey, how am I supposed to read our priorities? Because each business will treat things differently. Um, I'll tell you, you know, you know, Matt, you mentioned, you know, according to whoever submitted the ticket. Um, so I, I report to our president and COO and, you know, in, in our organization, you know, I, I get full reign on, on what's the highest priority. So if he came to me and said, look, I need this, I need this looked at, I'm going to say, I'll look at it right away. But if I also know that there's a high priority uh, that's also from another member of the team, I will explain, hey, this other item has to come before it. So yeah, he's my boss. So he could say, no, my stuff needs to come first. But we have a culture that that's not how it works. Uh, you know, the priorities are the priorities. If you get a good technical team lead, um, people should rely on that technical team lead to make the appropriate decision as to what is the highest priority. Uh, so it's, it's not always who submitted the ticket. You know, if our, if our CEO called and said, this needs to get done right away, um, if I agreed with it, I, and, and usually they wouldn't reach out <laughs> unless there was something really important. And I'm actually not doing my job. If the CEO is coming to me and knows about a problem with our code, uh, before I do, <laughs> um, so usually they're, the, the, the people that, you know, the, 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 the position of the person making the reporting the issue doesn't always affect the, uh, when you get to it, that that's up to it. You know, sometimes that changes, right. But we can get into that. Definitely keep that question, um, hot for the fireside chat. I'll get into it. So anything that's not marked as the highest priority, like at the top of the backlog, it's something as you can get to it. So get your highest priority items out of the way first. Um, and then anything lower, you know, hey, yeah, as you can get to it. Now, if you have a mix of bugs and you can, you clearly know that you could fix like three of the medium priority bugs versus a higher priority bug. If you're the only person on the team, you might wanna fix the three medium priority bugs before the higher priority bug so that you can just get those out of the way and you and then spend more time on the high priority bug. Front loading the low hanging fruit can actually be a very good idea because then you will have more time to concentrate on the higher priority bug. So keep that in mind. You don't always have to go for the, 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 the biggest issue. And when you get into your backlogs and your sprints, um, if there's things that can be obviously fixed quickly, you should get those out of the way as, as quickly as you can. Um, and maybe find someone on the team that can be dedicated to the high priority bug while others deal with the ones that are, that are quick hits. That way you can just kind of clean out the backlog and keep the system stable. Um, now, sometimes your priority will change so what's highest priority today may not be highest priority uh, this evening <laughs> or tomorrow. So keep your ear to the ground on that. This is why sprints are super important. You agree on what the work is going to be for the week or for the, the period of the sprint. And then it should take uh, an act of the technical lead or the scrum master or management to change anything in there. And it should be development management. Like management should never come to you directly and ask you to do something. Unless of course you're the manager. So once your sprint is in play, your, your priorities are already set for you because you should be focusing on that sprint, not on anything outside of it. So look at the sprint as a window to the priorities of your backlog. Everything that you, your, you as a team has moved into the sprint. Those are the current priorities. And if you are only a developer, that's not a bad thing. Being a developer is great. It's freeing because you don't have to deal with all the management headaches. <laughs> um, 
as long as you're focusing on your backlog and communicating with your team, you guys will just kick ass. Uh, the moment you lose focus and you start working on things outside of the backlog or outside of the, the sprint, while there's still items in the sprint, uh, that's when you'll lose focus. But you know that it's it's subject to change. But generally, if you have good management, it shouldn't change too often in a sprint. Actually, it should rarely change in a sprint, but it may change from sprint to sprint. So let's go through a few example tickets, though, because when bugs come in, there's the bugs that you that you see, and then there's the bugs that the users report. And users could be the business; they could be um, external customers, you know, for example, with like our app, Klipsch Connect, um, you know, consumers don't really report bugs. They just complain that something doesn't work because they don't have access to our internal ticket tracking system. Um, internally, uh, people running beta versions will say something doesn't work or they want something changed. But usually it's just something doesn't work and I'll get a Teams message, something's broken. Um, and then of course, there's the items that your team sees. So while developing, you see issues and you create tickets to fix them. So if you can't fix it right away, you create a ticket to fix it. And then you know, you'll prioritize it in the next sprint. Communicate that you found a bug uh, to your technical lead. They'll prioritize it in the backlog and um, it'll hopefully get into the next sprint so you can keep the system stable. Uh, and we will go through a few other items about how you can monitor this from a top level. So let's look at some example tickets. So your typical ticket, <laughs> this is, it's so common. It's like when your mom asks you for computer support, the app doesn't work. That's what it is. It doesn't work. You're going to get the, it doesn't work complaint. And they'll, they'll give you some topical information. You know, like, uh, I tried connecting, uh, give me an error. And maybe they'll tell you what device they're on. Like oftentimes they won't even tell you if they're on an iPhone or Android, or if it was on, you know, they're running Windows 10 or they were on vacation and didn't have Wi-Fi. They don't give you a lot of details. There's like, it didn't work and they're angry. So have some empathy for your user. Even when they give you this kind of crappy, uh, it doesn't work ticket, uh, have empathy for them because if they're not part of the dev team, they might not know how to uh, communicate this to you. It still sucks. It makes your work harder. It makes your job a lot harder, but just keep in mind, have empathy. So does anyone know, like what, what are some things that we don't know here? You know, just throw some out. What don't we know? Put it in the chat, or if you want, you can just say it on the, uh, uh, you could unmute if you want. Right, what error, you know, yeah, what, what error? Yeah, uh, at what point does the app stop working? So, you know, Matt was saying, what, what error did you get? I get an error, you know, that doesn't help me at all. Um, what point the app stops working? Good one, Jacob, you know, what are my repro, what are my repro steps? You know, what did you do to get to the point that it's broken? Um, when Billy was asking, when did it start? Jacob asked, is your app up to date? Great question. Um, I'll, I'll give you a little note about that one. So it, I plan out our, our releases a few ahead of time. So we're at version 161 of our app, but I'm working on 170. I know what I think will be in 180. So I plan them out following semantic versioning. If you haven't learned about it, go check out semantic versioning. I'll put a little note about that in the chat. Um, there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, Adam was saying, well, as a client or server, that makes a lot of sense. You know, so uh, when you're working with a web application or anything web-based, you know, something that you need to pay very close attention to when you're writing code is that is performance. And, you know, where could the issues occur? So when you're writing an app, you're really having a one-to-one -one experience. So performance really isn't as big of a thing. If something takes a second to process on the device, who cares? 
you know, you could, you, you probably don't even need to put a please wait indicator on there. It's just, you know, a second is a second. But if an operation takes a second on the server, well, what happens when you have a thousand requests that take a second? That's when you bring your server to your knees, to its knees, and the system goes down. So you, know, you got to think about those things. So good question there. Um, let's see. When did it start? Very good. You know, like, hey, we just released version 1.6 of our app. You know, uh, oh, you, you've been having this, this issue for the last two weeks. Yeah, I meant to tell you about it. Ah, shit. Okay. Uh, well, have you updated? And there's, you know, Jacob's question, is your app up to date? Yeah. Oh, no, I haven't. Well, go pl please go do that. Um, did it work before? Yep. Uh, that's, that's another really good one. What were you trying to do? That's reproduction steps, but yep. Um, what version of the app? Uh, what device are you on? Is it iPhone? Is it Android? Are you running? A lot of people won't know what version of the OS they're running, believe it or not. Uh, you may know because, you know, your, your technical people, uh, they don't know. They're just like, I don't know. I'm running I iOS. And you sometimes have to walk them through uh, going to general or on Android, going to settings. Um, by the way, on the Android stuff, for those of you that are Android developers, I don't know who is. Uh, don't get everyone to turn on developer mode. <laughs> if you know how to do that. Try to stay away from getting non-technical people access to developer mode because they'll break things playing around. <laughs> so just just a heads up. Um, let's see. Uh, great. So these are great questions. Uh, thanks for that. So those are things we don't know there. Now let's look at an atypical ticket. So I'm I'm going to toot my own horn here a bit by showing an example from my stuff, but. What we're trying to get away from when we're developers is having to ask these questions over and over and over again. It's a huge pain in the ass. Um, you know, if you ask that every single time, just think of the back and forth that you're wasting in the communication, just going back to this one. How much time did I waste getting that information from the customer? Waiting for their responses. I used to actually have like a, a, a list uh, exactly, but, but Billy, you know, the, the issue that you run into, cause he was saying ticket templates are a huge help. Well, those are great if you can get those implemented, but a lot of teams don't have that, but that's, that's a great way of thinking, get there. <laughs> uh, and I do cover that in a, in a bit. So an atypical ticket, although it's one that you want is clear details clear definition of done. Like when do I know I've fixed the problem or finished the feature? Mockups or screenshots, et cetera. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a feature, it should have like assets, you know, like all the icons, any audio, if there's supposed to be audio in there, um, high fidelity mockups, et cetera. If it's a bug, where are my screenshots? You know, what were the exact reproduction steps, et cetera. Um, and, and, Billy, like you were saying, um, oh, yep, that's a good one. Adam says build in automatic reporting to the app. Um, we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, I'll group that under logging and telemetry. So just remember those terms. Uh, but good, good comments, good comments. Uh, so you should, over time, work with your team to get these details ahead of time. So once you're comfortable, I'd say, you know, 90 days or so after you've got your first job, you get a sense for how the team works. Uh, that's where you can say, you know, hey, is there a way that we could get these details ahead of time? Is there anything we can do to improve our process? And you have to look at it, uh, not just from your perspective, but their perspective. So a little of it is, you know, getting the team to buy in to what you're trying to do. If you have the team's buy-in, you're gonna do, you're gonna get a lot of stuff done. If you don't have the team's buy-in, uh, things might come full stop. So, yeah, how does this make their lives better? How does this make 
our process faster? How does this increase our efficiency and in turn lower costs? Like we don't, you know, we'll be able to get 10 tickets done a week instead of seven, I think, if we front loaded a lot of these questions, because we've, it seems like we spend a lot of our time uh, dealing with asking, you know, getting more details. So how can we solve that? Uh, if, if you want uh, later, I can show you kind of what we did. Uh, I, I told everyone, look, if you want to report an issue to me, don't hit me up in Teams and tell me that there's a bug. Instead, we have a service desk portal uh, that goes and they can put all their detail there. And then I can move those tickets into the appropriate project that needs to get fixed. But the cool thing about that is all the things I need are in there. I can communicate with the customer before it even becomes a ticket that the development team sees. So here's a, you know, this, is a this isn't a bug, uh, but it's a feature request. <laughs> but just to give me an idea of how you do a ticket right, uh, give an overview, give context, um, a clear definition of done. You know, so for example, here's what I'm envisioning. When this is done, it should work this way. Don't think that people can read your mind. More detail is always better. I would rather read more than spend time trying to get more information out of you. If you over communicate, that's okay. I'll throw away the redundant info. But if you under communicate, you're suddenly wasting my time. Yeah, excellent, Jeff. Get confirmation of done from the user. So the user should agree that this is the definition of done. Um, oftentimes, that's what I'll do. I have to work with people from various parts of our company, uh, you know, from uh, headphones to sound bars to speakers, et cetera. Uh, and they want a feature. And they're like, hey, you know, th this is the capabilities that we, we want to uh, surface to the customer. And that needs to be done through, uh, say, our app or the web or what have you. Um, I will write up what I think, how I think it'll work. Um, but before I do that, I actually mock everything up. So I use a, a cool program. It's called Balsamic. I'll, I'll put the name of that here. Balsamic uh, mockups. Very cool tool. Um, and I can very quickly dr uh, wireframe out how I think this will work. It's not a, a high fidelity, it's a low fidelity mockup, but I can put that picture in front of them and say, hey, this is the flow that I think I understand. What am I missing? And it's so true that a picture is worth a thousand words. And then we usually set up a meeting and hash it out. And then I end up writing something like what you're seeing here. You know, here's the overview, here's the definition of done, here's the screen flow, et cetera. Because I'm not the one writing code. We have development teams you know, uh, in India um, and we have development teams here in the US and I need to make sure that it's very clear to them what they need to get done. So I need to translate that business rule into techno speak and make it so the developers understand what's going on. Um, and whenever the developers have a question, I can then communicate it back out to the business because the developers talk in technical terms and the business doesn't. So that's, that's you know, one of my roles. So this is just an example. So like you were saying, like all the questions that you were asking, it is okay to ask. I have found that when I've hired uh, new devs, they're afraid to ask sometimes. They're afraid of how it might look to not know the answer. That is uh, a bad approach. As a developer, you're gonna fail all the time, every day. And that's okay, fail quickly. <laughs> and you get better by revisiting your losses and then 
uh, you get more, eventually you get more wins than you do losses, but that's the part of development. You know, you're, you're always creating something from scratch <laughs> or fixing something that a lot of people, yeah, it, it hurts to fall, but you get back up just like Captain Marvel. Thankfully with um, programming, you know, <laughs> there's, a, you're, no one really understands it, you know, outside of your team. <laughs> ha, Chumbawamba, nice. Um, a little tub thumper. Uh, in programming, yeah, you, that's just the way it is. You know, I mean, you 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 build something from nothing all the time. Um, so, learn to communicate, 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 communicate. Don't spin. Whatever you do, uh, once you've hit the end of your rope, uh, you know, like you've tried figuring this out yourself. Stack Overflow didn't have your answer. Um, yeah, start reaching out. Don't sit there feeling bad for yourself. Yeah, that's it's okay. That's why you're on a team. Um, so if there's not enough detail or if there isn't enough info, go ask. And when you start the task, if it's clear you don't have enough information, reach out immediately because time <laughs> is gonna affect the, the person having the issue. So they're not gonna remember all the details. If they're having the issue that day and you don't have enough information, ask them, hey, can we get on a call and be more interactive about this? Can I see what you're doing? Can, did you get any errors, et cetera? Because I wanna help figure this out, but I, I don't have enough context. There's nothing wrong with letting them know you don't have enough information to get started. So let's go over some of the items that you should ask them for. Good ticket detail, yay. The information in the ticket, um, I, I like this sentence, <laughs> I wrote it, uh, can lead to or block its resolution. So number one, a clear description of what it is that's happening. If, if, if they just say it doesn't work, screw that. That, that's not okay. And eventually over time, you gotta get, you gotta train your customers not to do that. And everyone is your customer. Everyone outside your team, and well, and including your team is your customer. You're there to service them. So, and make the, the product better. So clear description. If you push back for a clear description, often people will eventually give you clear descriptions by default. Repro steps. How did you get to the point that you're having? You know, if, if you're having an issue and you just tell me it doesn't work when I do this, give me the exact steps. Like, did you bring, if it was an app, did you bring it back from sleep? You know, like was it in the background and you were on like the EQ screen and you ended up bringing back to the EQ screen and that's when it had an, it gave you an error? Or did you launch the app, select the device, Go to settings, select EQ, and then that's when you had the issue. What, what was that order of operations? Because I have no way of knowing what was going on. Uh, screenshots. Can you send me a screenshot of the error or the issue that you're having? What environment was it in? Is it iOS? Is it Android? Is it Android 10 or 11 or iOS 13? Or you're running an iPhone 6 that still has... Mac OS, you know, Mac OS, iOS 10 on it. And maybe we don't support that anymore. Maybe, you know, you think you're super technical and you're running an iOS beta. I don't know. What time of day did it happen? Because uh, I could go into the logs for that time of day and see if there were any exceptions. So if it crashed, I might be able to see it. And that will help me. What were you expecting to happen versus the actual result? Because it's possible that you don't know how to use your product. So um, one issue that I ran into, uh, I don't know, can you guys see my video? I can't tell. Can you see my video at all? So <laughs> this is one of our earbuds. This is probably the same thing that Pete's got. <laughs> um, so I got uh, a complaint that the firmware update wouldn't run. And 
I'm like, that's so strange because I never have any issues running the firmware update, but I know the exact steps that I'm supposed to follow. Both earbuds must be out of the case. The, the earbuds must be charged for a certain percentage. You can't, you shouldn't move to the, you shouldn't, you know, put the app to the background. You shouldn't go make a phone call while the firmware update's running. All these things. Customers don't know any of this, so we have to try explaining it. So <laughs> he's telling me that the update won't run. And I'm looking at him, and he's like, you see, look, you know, I'm trying to run the update. So what is my what is the issue with what's going on right here? Does anyone see? Anyone see it? Exactly. One bud is in the case. So nothing can communicate with this because this bud is off. So the firmware update, the app would see the device because Bluetooth low energy, it'll see this device. Keep in mind, when you get these true wireless earbuds, these are actually two devices. It's not one device in Bluetooth parlance. So because of that, you can have one earbud out and the other one in the case. That's a problem because you need to update both of them and communicate with both of them. So I go and said, wait a sec. It looks like you have one bud in your ear. He goes, yeah, so I go, you got to have both buds out of the case. You do? And they work for us. So now, are, are they dumb? Absolutely not. They're super smart. But they're not technical in that regard. They didn't know that the requirement for a firmware update. Exactly, Matt. No one told me that. So what we did is we modified the app to require you to have both earbuds out of the case and be at least 70% charged uh, before you could do that. So the, the funny thing is, is I actually started getting more complaints about our firmware update process once I did that. Because <laughs> people just want the update to work. Uh, the problem is, is they're not in a state where it does work. Um, you know, for example, I, I mean, I've got, you know, Samsung's earbuds here. I've got Sony's, you know, because I, I love looking at different software and just seeing like, how are they doing things? Uh, I think our app looks really good. Samsung's app is pretty cool, although it's not nearly as customizable. Uh, Sony's app looks like it's from like 1990. Um, but in order to update the Samsung's, you keep them in the case. So if you came from Samsung to Klipsch, you might be frustrated because the update process for your Samsungs requires you to keep them in the case. And the update process for Clips requires both of them out of the case. Um, so that doesn't make you dumb. That just, you know, it's, it's the who moved my cheese. It's your ritual. You know, you're used to the product working a certain way. And if that was your first wireless, you know, product, you'd be like, Hey, but no, wireless products were, you know, are supposed to be updated in the case. No, every manufacturer is different. Not all wireless products are updated inside the case. By the way, it can get very expensive to put all those smarts in the case. Okay. So <laughs> when a bug does come through, there's a few items that I try to tackle right away. Uh, so this is what I would call an, an easy bug, an easy fix. So if you can track these down, uh, you can probably fix it pretty quickly. So number one, what changed? If it was working yesterday and it's not working today, or if it was working in the last release and it's not, and it's not working today, or it was working in the current release and it's not working in the same release today, you have to ask what changed. Before you even look at code, what changed? What's, 
what's the scenario? And this is where your common knowledge comes in. Everyone, you know, what is your insight into what could go wrong? Like the first week into a project, this is, you're not going to have a lot of common knowledge because you're a week into it, but 90 days into a project. Yeah. You sure as hell are going to know where a lot of things are and where things could go wrong. So when you feel that, uh, when you get a, a bug report, you should be able to have a, a mental map in your head of all the points that could be affected and ask those questions. What could go wrong in all the different points and where, where could this be happening? Because that'll give you your starting point. The hardest part is, <laughs> oh, Matt had his coffee, nice. Um, the hardest part is finding out where to start. And once you've started, I think you can find the bug pretty quickly. Now, the question is how far away from the bug are you? Sometimes you'll be a lot, you know, you'll, you'll see an error in one part of the code, but really it was thrown somewhere else. And we'll get into that. Um, then what logs do you have? If there's an issue occurring, what logs do you have access to? So if there's like, maybe you're logging into SQL, uh, you've got like a log table, go look at that. See, uh, <laughs> repetition of, a, of an exception means something big is happening. If you have an exception happening over and over and over again, you should be able to get the min date through a simple SQL query of the first time that that started happening. Because that just, that if, if there's a bunch of them, <laughs> you should be able to figure that out. You know, oh, this started at like 2 a.m. Hmm. Well, hold on a sec. Is a system down? If it started at 2 a.m. on the same release, is it even our fault? Before you go and raise the alarms, get your bearing, build your, you know, set your foundation. What, what's your mission plan, you know, to solve this? You know, is it our fault? If it's a current release, Code doesn't have feelings. It doesn't get mad at you. So if if the release if nothing has changed, meaning you didn't do a release, chances are it ain't you. That doesn't mean you don't have to fix it, but it's not always a code issue. So keep those things in mind uh, before you even start on a bug. Get your bearings and figure out if it's even your fault especially these days with so many things that are um, uh, network centric, you know, web-based, what have you, uh, services go down all the time. So check the status portals. You know, if nothing changed in your code and you didn't do a release, go check status portals. You know, like in Azure, go to status.azure.com. You know, it'll show you all the systems and whether they're uh, operating properly. Oftentimes I have found that you can go to status.something.com and it'll have a, a dashboard of the systems that are having issues. Um, and if you don't see anything, well then yeah, you, you need to look further. But if you do see something, then now you know, wait a sec, I need to wait before I do, you know, before I look into this more because it looks like it's external to me. And even more so, like I was saying, with things being so web-based today or you know, service-based, you probably will end up relying on a lot of external services. So your code, again, may be fine and the other service may be down. Now, if you're getting exceptions in your system that are bringing your system down when somebody else's system is down, you have a problem in your code because you should be a defensive coder. And if a service isn't responding, your customers shouldn't see an error on your system that is uh, bad. Like they shouldn't get like the red screen of death or get some, you know, a, a 500 error page or a 404 or something like that. Yeah, you should be giving them an error that says, hey, can I currently communicate to this, to a service that we need? Um, 
we'll look into it. Yeah, you know, something that keeps the experience good. Because here's the thing about code. Nobody gives a crap about your code. The customers don't care. They'll never see your code. They'll never appreciate the technical feat of the technical genius that is you behind you know, that amazing uh, implementation of insert something here. They don't care. They see one fucking misspelling and your software is crap. One thing doesn't work. Your software is crap because that's all they understand. If they see a crash, you don't take care of it uh, in a, a, a friendly way. It's crap. Even if it's something you can never have imagined, all you have to do is wrap it in exception handling and throw you know, a, 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 a handleable exception that your system can manage. And then silent, you know, just log that and bring it to someone's attention. They see a message that's friendly that says, oops, something went wrong. Instead of, you know, the default error messages that, you know, like Chrome or whatever will show. <laughs> don't cry, Raquel. Or is it Rochelle? I don't know. I can't tell. <laughs> so keep these things in mind, you know, when it's your, when, you know, is it even your fault? Um, and, you know, another one that I've seen happen uh, a number of times is did an expected payload change. So it's possible that an external system that you rely on is now sending you additional data or change data and no one ever told you. That's something where your uh, debugging tools will help you figure that out. So how do you track these bugs? How do you fix them? How do you track them? So uh know your tools uh, a number of these are going to be common for you um and i'm not sure if i can see everybody's uh let me see if i can see all the people let's see if i can do this oh this is cool okay because i got like an ultra wide monitor over to the over to the right of me so it, i can i can look and, and ask people to raise their hand is it going to let me or? Oh, okay. It'll only show me so many at a time, apparently. Okay. Whatever. So how many of you know, using, does everyone know how to use the, uh, the little raise hand feature on, on Zoom? Okay. I imagine if you're in school all the time. Yep. 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 There we go. Yeah. Peter uh, raised his hand. Thank you for showing me that that worked. So can, can, if you know what a breakpoint is, raise your hand. I like all the dead air that I'm doing, you know, waiting for hands to be raised. Okay, great. So, and then raise your hand if you know what a stack trace is. So lower it if it's breakpoints and you don't know what a stack trace is. But who here knows what a stack trace is? Okay, cool. So this gives me an understanding. Um, so a breakpoint is a, is a spot that you can put in your code in your development environment that code execution will stop when execution reaches that point. So if I know that there's an issue in my login process, I may go find my login controller and at the point that uh, it's about to call into the login logic. I put a breakpoint. And the code execution will stop there. And then I can uh, step through that, you know, line by line or function by function and figure out where my exception is. A stack trace is when an exception is thrown. Generally, this is when it happens. Um, a stack trace tells me everything that led up to that point. So all the functions that led up to where the crash occurred. And uh, does anyone want to see an example of that? Because if you've never seen it, uh, you might want to see it. Anybody want to see it? Raise your hand if you want to see it. 
Okay, a lot of people want to see it. All right, cool. So yeah, you can see if I can live code. All right, let me see here. Boop, 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 boop. Oh, that's the 11 note. Let's see, where's Visual Studio? Hey, there we go. Okay, so everyone should be able to see my screen. I think I'm sharing my screen still. Am I? It doesn't, I can't tell if I am. Am I sharing my screen? Or did it stop sharing it? Yeah, it stop sharing. I just see all the videos of people right now. Oh, okay. All right, so screen one. <laughs> now, can you see my screen? There we go. Okay, good. All right, so uh, let's see here. Oh, cool. Uh, oh, okay, there we go. I need, let me get my fingers. There we go. Uh, static void. Um, Function one, everything goes nice and slow when I'm sharing my screen. Static void, uh, function two. And I'll, I'll even go over here. Static void, function three. All right, and Let's see. Do, 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 do. All right, so everyone see what I wrote here? I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick off a process. I'm gonna say um, function two, I'm gonna, from main, I'm gonna call function one. And function one, I'll call function two. Function two, we'll call function three. And then function three will blow things up. So now, does anyone see this guy right here, debugger.break? So there's some cool things that you can do here in Visual Studio. Uh, and I'll show them to you. So I can set a breakpoint. See a little breakpoint? Which means once you enter this block of code, I want you to stop all execution. So here's the, here's the normal thing that happens. Uh, I'm going to get rid of that for now. And then let's see if I can, can I move this stupid thing? There we go. Cool. All right. Let's hope my code compiles. It's probably some of the simplest code I could write. So let's hope it compiles. I get my little warning. Now, the typical developer that doesn't know about breakpoints, the program will run and then it'll quit. Let's see, let's see if, I, unless I have my exception settings set in a bad way. There we go. Okay, nothing happened. But didn't the program crash? I mean, behind the scenes, the program definitely crashed, right? I mean, it had to have been. But why, why didn't I, why didn't I see it? It's because I swallowed the exception. <laughs> I try catch, I swallow the exception. My code is perfect. There are no exceptions. Everything kept running. Well, that's BS, but I'm gonna put a breakpoint here. Oop, let's see, put it right there. You know, a little highlight of that code block. And now if I run it, if I have that breakpoint in there, I should hit it. 
All right. So now you should be able to see things done be broke. All right. I am in the exception. And by the way, I have uh, uh, Ozcode installed. Ozcode will make things wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, all right. Yep, I, I got you. I got you, Mark. I know you want my attention. So I can go take a look at my exception here. Come on, show me the exception. So I get the message. I can see the data, the message, things done be broke. But look at this. Here's our stack trace. So let's go close that. Okay, yeah, I get it, Mark. Yep, I know you want attention. So take a look at the stack trace. I started at main. I ended up in function one, ended up in function two, and then my exception was thrown in function three. I can tell from the stack trace where it was thrown. Simply, I, I don't even have to look at code. I can say, oh, starting in main, Function one was called, function two was called, ended up in function three. That's when execution stopped. And that's where I ended up in this breakpoint or with this exception, not the breakpoint, but this is where that exception was thrown. It's a map that will take you directly to where the error occurred or at least seemingly where the error occurred because you can see all that. Ooh. There might have been multiple try catch statements throughout that whole chain. That might not actually be where um, where it was originally thrown. But does everyone see this? How this might be useful? So learn about how to get your stack trace. Um, a few other items that are in here. Come on. Let's see. All right. I can just take a look at this. Uh, all right. So by the way, this is Oz code. This gives me a, a tabbed view of the exceptions and how it got to that point. Uh, Oz code is not free. Uh, it's uh, $180 a year, but it's worth every penny. Um, it'll save you a ton of time in debugging. But here you can see there's an inner exception. So usually when you wanna work with your exceptions, you actually want to look at the inner exception because the inner exception, uh, what you can do here, you can say um, ex.getBase exception. That will get you the original exception that was thrown across the line. So if you went through multiple catch statements to get to this final one that blew up, like I don't know how to handle it at this point. <laughs> Family account, yeah. Um, actually, they do have a gr uh, group licensing, so you know, talk talk to uh, talk to Pete, <laughs> and they have a free trial, so yeah, free is good. Uh, get base exception is really what you should be doing. So if you're doing exception handling and you're trying to log something, don't just do ex.message because that's only the current message. You want to get the base exception, which if there is no inner exception or chain of exceptions that got you to that point, it will return the current one. So you don't have to check, do I have an inner exception, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to do that. And then you can get the message off of that or the stack trace. It's all there for you. Lots of stuff. So I'm going to show one more thing here or a few things. One is, uh, let's see. I'm 
I'm not even, I'm just not going to do anything here. I'm just going to catch it. I'll let it run. So should this just run? I mean, it did, right? It, it did nothing. But didn't an exception occur? So here's the problem. You're going to find a lot of code that has catches. When really, the error is occurring there. How do you catch those? Do you put a breakpoint in every single exception handler? Here, you're dealing with 20 lines of code. What happens when you've got a million lines of code? Yeah, Peter, you could log each exception thrown, but how do you do that? You got to go to every thrown exception and log it, right? Because if it's caught and they don't log it, was it really thrown? <laughs> If a tree falls in the woods, does it make a sound? If no one's around, if no one's around, I left that part out. Everyone knows what I was talking about. So here's the thing. In Visual Studio, if you go to exceptions, so this is under debug. Um, oh God, where is it? Is it under debug? I thought it was under debug. Should be debug windows. Yeah, debug windows exception settings. I always keep this one available. I just tab it down here. You'll see common language runtime exceptions. If you just check that, it'll stop on everything, regardless of whether it was caught and handled. And by the way, if you want to know like how do you, you know how do you get it back, you can either keep clicking to get the the, the weird hybrid box, or you can right click it and select restore defaults. So if you want to get back to the defaults, just right click it. You're not going to mess anything up. But if you're, if you're not seeing any errors, but there's an error occurring, like something's not happening, you probably have an exception handler swallowing the error. It's very likely. So all you do in Visual Studio, at least, is check that. And now when you run it, I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to add a single breakpoint. It immediately finds it when it got thrown. And it breaks at the point that it's being thrown. It's not going into the exception handler, right? It's not going into the catch block. Because the exception is being thrown right there. So it won't bring you down here because this code hasn't run yet. And this is where Oz code comes in really handy. You can see all the details. And you can see, here's a, a previous exception that I dealt with. They'll let you see that an exception has been thrown before in this application. And you can close it. That setting, when I first found this setting, yeah, Pete, uh, I was like, there's got to be a way. <laughs> and I was like, I wonder what, you know, this, you know, let's look in the debug windows. Oh, exception settings. Not to interrupt. Yeah. That's a life changer right there, man. If I, if I would have known about that setting five years ago, <laughs> a couple months of debugging time between then and now. Yep. That's awesome. So uh, we'll hit continue, you know, and then of course, you know, the, it'll hit the catch block and, the program will stop running. Um, I'm going to set these back. Now, maybe what I want is if I'm debugging and I hit this endpoint, or probably I hit this breakpoint, or uh, this uh, exception handler, sorry, this exception handler, if I'm debugging, I want it to stop execution so I can look at what happened. I may normally want this to be swallowed, but if I'm debugging, I don't. So how do I do that? 
So I can say if debugger is attached, debugger.break. Now I don't have to have that if debugger is attached. Yeah, if there's no debugger, it'll probably ignore it, but I would only do that if it's attached anyway. Um, but now I can run this and you, so you have full access to the debugger in .NET. So that's the message there. So if the debugger is attached, it should break. And there you go. So I don't even have to set a breakpoint. So you can break, you can set a breakpoint anywhere. Now, um, I can go in and you know into debugging in in more detail, uh, but we only have so much time. I have some other things to cover. Uh, so the, this is something you should go learn about. Go learn about debugging for your particular platform. Uh, so in Visual Studio, look up debugging, and if you're doing JavaScript development, learn how to debug in VS Code. Um, you know, learning about step into, step over, step through, et cetera. Um, uh, what are you looking for, Alec? Oh, on, on the Mac, on, is that Visual Studio Mac? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, you know what? I'm not, that's a great question. I don't know. Um, if you just go to your uh, settings, I might be able to find it. I just didn't know where the. Well, I'm not on my Mac. Under the so debug I'm, menu, okay. Yeah, so I so the place you find it on in VS Windows is um, debug, then Windows, then exception settings. And it's okay. probably in a similar place Thank in you. VS uh, VS Mac. Yeah. So Got all it. of your all of your debugging tools, you can go right here. There's so much to learn here. There's a ton of things to learn. By the way, um, even though an exception has is, it's been caught, there's other things that you should learn about here, like debug Windows call stack. Um, let's see, is it gonna bring it up? Where is it, where is it? Where's my call stack? <sighs> I don't know where it put it. But anyway, the, the call stack is very useful. I wonder where it is. It's probably behind some window somewhere on my three screens. But anyway, good thing to look at is the call stack because when you're not in an exception, it'll show you how far along it is. Or, you know, like where you are in your, your application, like how you got to where you are. It'll give you the same thing as the stack trace, but the stack trace is when you have an exception, the call stack is when you don't. And you can actually navigate, like you'd say, oh, you know, I'm in function three. Well, take me a function one. You just double click function one. It'll bring you there and you can see all the values of all the variables in that function. So what values did you pass into the function as having an issue? So you can figure out, hold on a sec, that's not a valid uh, value. That would blow things up. But knowing where you are is, is insanely important. Okay. Do, 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 do. All right, is my, is my screen still sharing? I hope it is. Okay, because like the little, the little display disappeared for, for screen shares. <laughs> yeah, like, I don't, I don't know. Yay, Zoom, ship it. Okay. So let's get back to PowerPoint stuff. Um, so like I said, watch out for swallowed exceptions. Those will be one of your worst enemies. Um, now, when it comes to JavaScript development, uh, you should know about the network monitor. Uh, I, I imagine that you guys have played with this plenty of times. Um, let's see here. Uh, uh, what is it? What is it? It used to be like shift F12 or whatever, but now it's, yeah, there it is. So, you know, your developer tools, 
are hugely important. So your ability to look at the network traffic is very important. Uh, you should learn how to use this tool to figure out what's going on. So, you know, if you're looking at uh, like status codes, You know, like if you've never seen status, you know, like if you don't know what all the status codes are, good things to learn about, you know, so uh, learn these, learn your status codes, learn your cats. Like whenever there's a bad request, you know, you should realize HTTP 400 is a bad request. 401 uh, would be unauthorized. You know, 404. So not found, 500. So, you know, and then of course, you know, like if things are good, you'll see an okay. But sometimes you'll get okay back when it's actually not okay. So consider, yep, yep, I'm a team pot. Yep, yeah, I was at 417. Oh no, maybe it's 420. I'm trying to remember what it is. Is it 420? Oh no, that's the that was two days ago. I don't know. I don't remember what, what well, it's 418. Sure You're right. Yeah. 418. Yeah, I'm a teapot. So um there's a dog's one too, but it's not as anywhere near as funny. These are just these are much cuter. Um boy, I didn't even realize that 420 was a thing on this one. What was it? Enhance your calm. That's hilarious. Okay. Ha. Huh. Anyway, uh, the point is, is that if you're getting into REST, uh, some people implement REST properly, others will not. So uh, sometimes you'll get a, a 420 back, or probably 420, you'll get a, um, a 200 back when actually it, it wasn't okay. And if you look at the JSON payload that came back, it'll say an error occurred. So don't assume that 200 is definitely okay. Learn your HTTP status codes. Um, Postman will help you here. Like you were trying to figure out like how things should work. Um, uh, if you haven't seen Postman, you should see Postman. Postman is awesome. All right, everyone stop thinking about 420. Stop touching the sky, come back. And Postman should not be your enemy. It is a wonderful tool. Uh, unless you have like the, I think there's like the original browser accept, uh, extension installed or whatever. And then it complains over and over again that you should uninstall it because there's a, this other tool. And then you, you're like, well, how the hell do I uninstall it? And there's no way to uninstall it. And then I got a new computer and the problem went away. So yeah, it was, uh, yeah. So anyway, hopefully I don't show anything that is a, a company secret. Do, 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 do. Uh, if it comes up, man, this is the worst part about sharing my screen. Everything runs slower if I'm sharing my screen. So anyway, whenever that comes up, Do, 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 do. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it's just a great tool. Um, whenever it comes up, it'll be even better. Boop, 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 boop. Let's wait for it. Yep, that's great. I'm not going to run an update right now. Okay, cool. So, uh, I can actually talk to our soundbar. Um, and find out like my serial number is, assuming it's uh, uh, serial, it's IP hasn't changed. So I can actually get data back. Um, so this isn't anything crazy proprietary, uh, but yeah, I can use this tool to figure out information. Yeah, and what you can also use this for is building test cases. So if the, if, 
the you can build tests using Postman. You can say, hey, okay, here's all my tests, or here's all the calls I'm supposed to be able to make. Well, when I make that call in the, the area that seems to be broken in my app, if it fails or it gives me unexpected data, now I found my problem. So if you can create Postman collections of all the um, uh, calls that you're trying to use, then you should be able to debug, uh, or figure out what data is coming from like the services that you're working with that might have broken your code. Remember, what happens if the payload changes? If you're doing a mapping of like some JSON to something, and uh, let's let's say you're in JavaScript and uh, you get a JSON payload back, and they changed it from enabled to is enabled, but they never told you. Well, what's the default in JavaScript if something comes back null or undefined? How does that translate as a bool? It's false. But you used to always get true back. Well, is that your code's fault? Maybe, but something external to you changed. So maybe someone updated a library and didn't realize that that was a, a side effect of it. So you can test that here. Of course, you know, we'll get into unit tests and so forth, but still, Postman, great tool. Um, another tool that'll help you there is Fiddler. Uh, I don't have Fiddler installed right now, so I'm not gonna get into it, uh, but definitely check out Fiddler from the folks over at Pro, uh, uh, Progress, Progress, whatever. Um, testing frameworks, you know, so know your tools on your testing frameworks. <clears throat> yeah, you should know about MS test. You should know about JUnit if you're you know, Java, you know, if you got uh, Jasmine, all your different tests, uh, you should understand what those are. You might not be doing unit tests just yet. Let's see if I can make this actually work. There we go. Is it still sharing my screen, Pete? Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, understand what those testing frameworks are because as you, when you get your first job, if they use unit tests and integration tests and so forth, that they, you know, whether it's TDD or not. Um, TDD doesn't, you know, if you're, you don't have to do TDD to do unit tests. TDD is test-driven development. So just a note, those, they, they're not, um, they're not mutually exclusive, but they also don't rely, they were, uh, rely on each other. Uh, so definitely learn about those. Ozcode, I already showed you, really amazing tool. If you use link, it'll change your life. Um, Rev debug, that one's free. Uh, it'll actually, after you like run your app, and it'll give you some of the capabilities like Ozcode, but after you run your app, you can actually see on a timeline all the exceptions that occurred and play it back. You, so you can zoom to that execution point and it'll show you your application in its state as if it was running. So you can see all the values of all the variables for e during each exception. Basically play back the entire um, debugging session, one line at a time. It's very cool. So if you haven't gotten it, it's very cool. It will make things a little slow, but you, know, you can turn it on and off. Uh, and then application insights and app center, uh, we'll talk about those uh, a little more in a bit. Why don't we take a, a five minute break um, and we'll get into being proactive about things. So yay, bio break. I need some water anyway, my throat's getting sore. Great stuff so far, Ari. I'll pause the recording for five minutes. <laughs> I'm back. And recording is resumed. Ooh, recording's resumed. So you know, other than your tools, for when an issue has occurred and you're trying to fix it. <laughs> the best thing is when you don't have to deal with an issue in the first place. So be proactive. Rather, you know, rather than if you want to go and cool, do all the cool things about building new features, etc., you need to be a planner, a good, de a good developer <laughs> and take your time um, before writing code so that you can build bulletproof code. So I love this line. I've, I've got a, I used to have this poster 
in my bathroom. Now I have it in my garage. <laughs> but it says, <laughs> write your code as if the person who will maintain your code is a psychopathic killer who knows where you live. So whoever's going to maintain your code, they will want to, they're, they're a killer. So make sure they're happy with maintaining your code. So before you write code, plan, plan ahead. I cannot stress that enough. Don't write code first. Yes, you're going to a coding academy. But that doesn't mean that you need to solve everything with code. You need to solve everything with planning. The easiest part of development is writing code. Code, as I have, I have learned in, in, in I know, almost 40 years of doing this, code is the easy part. Having a plan will take time, and it'll, but it'll weed out the bugs and the issues before you even write them. <laughs> I'm glad you like it, Jacob. So, oh, and I only give us I only give us around a five minute break. I'm sorry, Pete. Not a problem. It'll be a ten minute break if we're in person. So anyway, um, number two. Code with intent. So before you start writing any of the code, build out your interfaces, stub it out. So you get a big picture view. Your implementation shouldn't be the most important part. Your intent should be. Because if you understand your intent, your implementation is clear. If you start with the implementation and don't know your intent, what, what the hell? <laughs> That's the whole, you know, seeing the forest through the trees. So code with intent. <laughs> I actually have a whole thing about that somewhere. Um, by the way, if you code with intent, that will uh, really lead you into dependency injection and inversion of control. Um, yeah, that's a point. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so you had to you had to do some of the code to learn what you needed to plan for. That's that's true. But once you once you get past understanding code, because code is you know like remember it's like learning English. So once you once you've learned how to speak, then now you now uh, now you need to become a good speaker. Like the whole think before you talk thing that they teach you when you're a kid. Yeah, while you were a kid, you learned you know. English. And then they taught you, hey, you know, think before you speak. Think before you say anything. Try to take the same approach with your code. So, for example, uh, I, need, I need to, uh, let's say I need to write something that needs to interface with some external service. So, let's say it's a, a telemetry service. Well, I could just immediately start writing code and write a function for send data and write a function for get data and you know, write some functions for, you know, I don't know, sanitize data and blah, 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 blah. The problem is, is I've, I just started with code. I haven't actually thought about everything I need to do. What I should really be doing is saying, okay, if I need to work with telemetry, I'll need a service that provides me the, the, the abilities to do what? Okay, get data, yep, send data, yep. Uh, that might be all I need to do, but I'm not sure. But here's what I'll do is I'll write an interface that says this is what I'm able to do. And then the cool part about that is by building the interface, I don't care about the implementation. I can start building interfaces that talk to other interfaces uh, and none of the implementation is done. So I kind of map out how things are going to work and I will add and remove functionality that I will need without ever writing any implementation. Because as I build out the interfaces, I realize, oh yeah, I need to change this uh, interface to have these functions or this, these capabilities 
um, or this information for this service to work. And I've never written an implementation. Uh, the cool thing about that is that then when you actually get to writing your implementations, you can use what's called mocking frameworks to build fake implementations of all of those. So you can get things working together all without writing any code because the mocking framework will just simply hand you an object that has all the functionality in it and it'll act the right way. It'll return true, a false, a certain object type, et cetera. Um, and you don't care because your intent is being satisfied. The implementation, when you code with intent, the implementation should not matter. The intent, the, the operation you're trying to perform is what matters. So that way, anyone could write that implementation. And as long as it follows the interface, which is your intent, you don't care how they did it. You'll care if it breaks, but that's not your problem. Unless, of course, you have to fix it. But even if you have to fix it, at least you know their intent from the very beginning. Something I enjoy doing uh, when I'm building an interface is I comment the interface and I don't comment the actual implementation. I'll put comments in there, but I can read the, implement, the, the, the interface and go, oh, this is everything this does. And here's why it does it. Got it. Okay, cool. And if I need the implementation, okay. But if I need to look at the implementation, then I don't understand the intent. And if you can't code, if, if you don't start learning to code with intent, it'll be very hard to start writing unit tests. Because what you'll end up doing is trying to write functions that do more than what they should do rather than coding to your actual original specification, which was your intent. Uh, that is a long topic to get into at some point, maybe a separate uh, <laughs> workshop. Um, if there are business rules, comment them. You know, if, if, there's, if this is something that is not obvious and it is, there are complex business rules associated with this code that you're implementing, put what you're trying to do in a comment. Um, something else that I've done uh, with, uh, with newer developers uh, that I have always found useful is it's easy to get lost in your code. You know, you're, you're just thinking about the code, but you're not thinking about the intent or the big picture. You're just like, oh, I gotta get this done. I gotta get this done. How am I gonna do it? Uh, I would actually write comments. So like if you're gonna build a function that does something, rather than starting the code, uh, you could write the function. Um, and then inside of the function, write comments that explain step-by-step -step what you're trying to do. Uh, so for example, uh, can, you see, can you see Visual Studio still? Um, I can say, okay, like in, in function two, um, uh, get the initial set of data, um, make sure it's clean and what we expect, um, send it to the database, make sure things went well, Return the result. Now all I have to do, now I can go and write my code here. And first I'll get the initial set of data and I'll call my code to go get that. I don't know. And make sure it's clean and what, what to expect. Okay, uh, function three. Um, Whatever, the, the point is by writing the comments first, I can work through this just like a, a document outline and get my code done. And now all my code is already segmented. So if I wanted to refactor some code, like, oh, you know what? This is make sure it's clean and what, and what we expect. I could take that code out, 
and put it in a function called sanitize. You know, um, and put my code in there and then call sanitize. But the point is, I wrote I wrote the comments first. So I don't get lost. I don't lose my big picture. And it's just easier, especially as you're learning to code. Write it in the language you understand first. Write it in some English. And then just fill it in. You'll make it better over time. But this way you can see, okay, step one, I got to do this. Step two, I got to do that. You don't have to keep it all in your head. Use comments to your advantage. So comments aren't just good for business rules that you need to document or why you're doing something a certain way. They're also a good bookmark, <laughs> a good organizational tool. They get thrown away anyway. Some, some people will tell you comments are the devil. Um, wait till you have to maintain code six months later. And then everyone has an excuse. They're like, well, you should have written unit tests. You should have done this. You should have done that. Or you could have written a freaking comment. And you could have done that in the beginning. But because some alpha developer told you that comments are bad, you didn't do it. So be wary of alpha developers. <laughs> Take everything with a grain of salt. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, unit tests, this is something that over time you're going to learn more about. Uh, but write unit tests. Um, First, if you can, you know, this is an approach. By the way, this is not a requirement. I'm not saying you have to do this. These are all ways that you can be proactive, but you can write the unit test first and then write the code and make sure that the unit test passes, that the expectations pass. That is test-driven development, by the way, in a nutshell. Uh, and then, of course, write integration tests. Um, I've got this... Uh, this is a great article. Let me let me open it and I'll put the link in our chat um, if I can get. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I get it. There we go. Ha, he moved it to his old blog. Cool. But anyway, uh, you don't have to read that right now. Oh, hold on. I put it in the wrong place. Hold on to everyone. There, not to Pete, to everyone. There we go. Um, yay. Uh, yeah, I'll make the PowerPoint available. Don't worry. Nothing proprietary in here. Uh, let's see. Osco. No, I already talked about Osco. Let me come back to this. There we go. Uh, now, seek pull requests. If you have not done a pull request, um, a pull request is your opportunity for the, the code that you are working on to be reviewed by a peer, whether they're a senior to you or not, before it goes into the main code base. It is important to get that peer review because your peers working with you will make you a better developer and you'll make your peers better developers. So issue pull requests. Don't ever ignore a pull request. Don't go, well, you know, okay, I know that you're a good developer, so I'll just accept the pull request. Bullshit. You should go and read through that, the, the, read through the code they, they changed or added and put legitimate, candid feedback on it. If there's nothing wrong, fine, accept it. But if there's something like, you know what, this doesn't look right. Like, are you sure that, you know, should we put an exception handler around this? Like, wouldn't this be an issue in the field? You should let them know that and let them fix it. it there's nothing wrong with rejecting a pull request. Uh, if you're writing something and you don't really know the domain very well, um, find someone who knows that domain well, you know, like let's say the authentication system, et cetera, and make sure they do the pull request, the, 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 the review of the pull request. It doesn't just have to be one person. You can seek out who you know knows better than you do 
and have them help you become a better developer. Because if it's part of the system you've never worked in before, and now you've learned about it, and they used to work on it all the time, they may know something you don't, which is why all code should go through a pull request before it goes to the main branch or master branch, whatever. So keep that in mind. Uh, I'm a big fan of pull, uh, pull request reviews and would encourage you to do one of those at least once a week. Um, now, if something wasn't in the logs and you found a miss, get it in the logs. Because anything that will help you be proactive or find bug details, when you find a gap in your ability to diagnose, plug, the, plug that hole. Same thing for test cases. You, you missed the test case, whether it be a unit or integration test, or just like your own testing practices, like these are the things that needed to be tested. Plug the hole. Don't put it off. Don't go, oh man, we really need to go do something about that next time. If you say that, get it done. Or it may never get done. Um, and then of course, use telemetry and analytics systems like Application Insights and App Center. Uh, these are a heads up display of your stability. Let me see, I'm, I'm not sure, did I have? Oh yeah, okay. So I don't know that we'll have time to go through all the bugs that you're already having, but I do wanna show you this, uh, this App Center stuff. Do, do, do. You should be able to see my screen still, yeah? So let me know if you can't see. You can see my still my screen still, Pete. I see. Just yeah. Okay. Cool. I can see it. Yeah. I, I can see you shake your head. <laughs> All right. So let's take a look. I, I can't go show you Klipsch's details, but let's take a look at. Um, I wrote an app that the city of Fishers uses for tracking all COVID patients um, uh, for tests, not tracking the patients, but tracking, uh, scanning them in for tests and making sure that data gets to the lab. So I can just click diagnostics. This is App Center. And I can see how many crashes I've had. So I've had zero crashes in the past month. Yay! But I have had errors that have been caught. Now these, when I looked at them, I can go see like, here's like the 53 that occurred. And it tells me, hey, like it's telling me there's 53 reports. I can see the reports that occurred by device. I can see the stack trace, uh, remember that one? So it called get patient details and then in um, from my Fisher's test services and then in refit, which is a very cool uh, library for building HTTP clients, um, it died in some HTTP call. So get patient details and then something died in, in uh, HTTP call. Here's my device. Here's the network they were on and a user ID, the OS, English. These are things I didn't even have to ask the customer about. Not that it matters. There's, only, there's like 10 devices out in the field. So they all appear as like 10 users, even though there's, you know, a thousand tests a day or whatever. But the point is, I could spike this and see, here's the exception that I'm getting back. Response code doesn't indicate success. 401, unauthorized. We all remember that one? Unauthorized. <laughs> the code had not changed. This was just sitting in the field and this error, as you can see, spiked. So I'm like, well, actually I should mark this as closed. <laughs> the issue ended up being 
external to our system. It wasn't the app. The Yep, an external service went down, Adam. So the provider that had some server issue. And to be fair, there's nothing I could do about it. Like, you know, my app would just say, you know, uh, wasn't able to get patient details. So note that in my in my diagnostics, I didn't crash. No crashes. I didn't just kill the app. I gave them a semi-friendly error message that says, hey, you know, couldn't get the patient details or patient could not be found, which was true. <laughs> it, could, it couldn't get the details. Um, so I was able to see this uh, and diagnose it without even opening the code. Without even opening Visual Studio, I was able to tell them, we're getting a 401. I think something's happening on your end. Because what changed? Nothing. Did the payload change? It shouldn't have. Uh, domain knowledge. Nothing changed. This is a simple HTTP call. Uh, from the point of them uh, scanning a QR code, because the QR code would have yielded a different error if it couldn't read it. So the error is occurring when it makes a call to the external service. I can tell without even opening Visual Studio that this is the issue. And so I told them, I'm like, I think it's your system. I, I, I'll, I'll go look at the code, but I am 99% certain that it is, it's your, it's, it's not us, it's them. And sure enough, they came back later in the day and said, yeah, we're having some problems. Uh, that was that one. This one, they deleted our key accidentally. Oops, our, our, our access key got deleted. <laughs> so that was, that one was fun. Anyway, FYI, uh, this one I think was an Azure outage, connect helper, connect async, but no, the app didn't crash, app didn't crash, yay. I can see what device they used, et cetera. I can also look at the analytics. So I can see how people are using the app, how often they use it. So on average, four minutes and 40 seconds. I can see how many people are using the app, you know, that the patient was saved successfully, patient was tested on time, um, how many people are ineligible for a rapid test, how many people went, and um, App Center is generally for mobile applications, but it all feeds into Application Insights. So Microsoft's Application Insights gives me even more info, and you can use that for your other applications. So Jeff, to answer your question, um, if you wanted to, you would just use Application Insights, and I can show you what that looks like. Uh, let's see, data management. Where was it? Export. Application Insights. So you can see this is exporting all the data to Application Insights. Uh, yep, it's just a NuGet package. Just go to appcenter.ms. It'll walk you through the whole thing. View it in Azure. Application Insights is way cool. Oh, okay. I'm, well, I'm in the wrong the wrong account, don't worry. There we go. Now I'm in the wrong subscription. <laughs> there we go. Now it finally redirected me, uh, but it's in the wrong subscription. Uh, so switch directory to my default directory, it's great. Um, so Adam, if, remember everyone that works with you is your customer. So it depends. The answer to your question is it depends. 
you don't want to go look that's not my that's not my issue and i know this probably isn't your intention but you know that's not us that's them go talk with them the the right thing to do i feel would be loot those people in to the conversation and say hey we're getting an issue um we we've traced it to being on what appears to be on your end would you please go look at this and if we need to hop on a call let's hop on a call yeah that makes you your a you're communicating b you're staying in the loop so you still have some ownership and yeah you, know, you want people to realize that even if you can't find even if you don't know the answer you'll work to get it for them um so they will keep coming back to you but the the key is you then build a good relationship. If all you do is shift blame, yeah, you know, people can go on the defensive, and you want you want to be careful of that. Remember, have empathy, not just for your your customer that reached out to you, but for the vendor that you need to go work with. Now you won't always get empathy in return, <laughs> um, but you know you just have to deal with that. That's just working with people. Those are soft skills. Yeah. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Uh, so here's something I can do uh, with my user flows. <clears throat> Once I pull data into Application Insights, which it's always exporting to Application Insights, you can do some amazing things. But you can say, you know, in the past seven days, when people started the app, create the graph, I can immediately see a kit was scanned successfully, and then they went to the patient was found, and then they saved this, the patient. So whenever a patient was found, saved successfully, the patient primarily tested on time. Um, I, it's, <laughs> I would love to show you, even though I can't, I would love to show you the clips details because we use this uh, religiously uh, to figure out how people go through the app and what features they use. So we figure out, hey, is there a great feature, but it's hidden and no one sees it? Why aren't people using that feature? And we can decide, okay, should we push an in-app notification? Like, did you know that your device can do this? So uh, that's something that you know, this data, have you noticed how little code we've looked at today? We've actually looked at almost no code other than my writing code. We haven't really looked at code. Um, it's really the tooling has gotten us to understanding different approaches to solving issues and the code minimal amount okay so that's uh application insights and app center do, 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 do. if i can close that close that boop 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 cool um Oh, I already went through that part. So uh, I don't think we have time to go through my broken code example. Um, but is does anyone want to do any live debugging or would you rather do the fireside chat? What do you think, Pete? Well, this workshop's for everybody else besides me. So I would like to hear from the classes on what they think would be best for them. So. What do y'all think? All right, we have one vote from Peter for fireside chat. Eddie likes fire. Just uh, asking questions, really, that's what it is. That's what the fireside chat is. Really, I should do like the Zoom side chat. It's not really a fireside chat. Um, I mean, we can look at one, Alec. You know, if you want to look at your bug, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know. Um, we could spend five minutes looking at bugs and then do the fireside chat or 10 minutes looking at bugs. 
Go for it, Alec. I don't know if I can solve it, but hey, you know, I'm I'm willing to look. Is it .net? It's not. It's it's uh it's React. Oh, that's okay. Let's let's see. Hold well, on. This is talk. actually yeah. This is back end. Uh, go ahead and share. Is that okay, everybody? <laughs> it's it's a weird one. Yeah, go for it. All right. Oh, oh, I think you might have to stop screen sharing for me to share. Oh, I'm gonna have to find out where that option is because it went somewhere. Let me see if I. Oh, there it is. It's hidden. Okay, stop share. No, oh, no, no, no. Stop share. All right. Now can you see it? Or have the option? Do you guys see yeah. VS Code? I see VS Code. Okay, great. So I'm in my node modules here <laughs> because um, I'm getting this strange error. Where's the error? I'm, bu I'm building a server here. So the, the error is. So can I read property push of undefined? Right. In so that this dot stack, so stack is undefined. I mean, it's telling you that stack is undefined. So yeah, so why would the question here would be asked, why would stack be undefined? So I've okay. I've tried to confirm that there were no dependencies that uh, didn't install or anything. This is a uh, I'm in I'm in Blue Badge uh, web development, so I'm with a, a group project, um, yeah. and so I made sure that there were no dependencies that were uh, uninstalled, anything like that. Um, and I'll replicate the. Uh, see, I've never had an issue in my node modules. That's what I mean by a weird one. Um, I've, I've never had this kind of, of issue. So take a look at that stack trace. See that stack trace? It says in function route over in that file right there that's a uh, node modules express lib router index.js. Uh, line 502, um, 14. So by the way, you can over just go over to, um, if you go to the search over on the left, I think, I think you could, uh, Actually, if it's if there's an error, well, I don't know if you could double click it. You might want to turn some tools on for this. Um, you could just search for that path. Just copy copy that path, oh, right? There. Sure. Just like um, the e-commerce. Where where is it? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, just see if you can find. Yeah, see if you can find that. Uh, get rid of the index part. Oh, okay. Well, it won't let you. Oh, well, <laughs> I was, I was hoping. So this is where having your debugger attached would be super important. Yeah. Can I make I was, a comment? Feel free. Jump in folks. Each time that I am working through um, a, a bug and it points out one of the issues that's coming from node module, you can typically look into that error a little bit further and it will point to places in your code that are referencing those nodes. And those right. are normally the places where I have the errors. It's not in the node modules itself. It's how I referenced them. And in that error, it pointed to your shop controller at line seven, and it pointed to your controller index at line two. And you might consider looking at both of those first to make sure that you are referencing those modules properly. Yeah, so let's take a look at that, right? So let's look at the, let's look at the error message. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so you guys see, okay. Way. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so we'll echo what, what Jacob was saying here. Um, you see how, is this the most current version of your error message you're getting, or is there more to this error message? Yeah, this is it. <clears throat> okay. So shop controller, JS, line seven, position eight. And that's definitely the latest code, router.get. So is there a path called test? Is test an actual path? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Ah, I commented it out. Ah. Okay, thank you. So, so the problem wasn't in Express in my, in my node modules. It's with the way I've referred to it. That helps me. Okay, thank you guys. Yeah, so I'm, so I'm when you gonna say to anyone in web dev, if that it comes across as a node module issue, check all your code before you blame it on the node. Yeah, it's probably not. Yeah. But let's go back to that code or that, that oh. error message. Let's, let's, let's look at that again. I wanna point out a few things that are red flags. This is why I asked, is test a real thing? Absolutely. Can you see? So take a look. It says, cannot read property push of undefined. That should clue you in that something didn't resolve properly. Something's coming back as null or undefined. Yeah. And the route is saying, so yeah, uh, I, I can't push. I there's no function or or property for whatever is going on in function route. And then if you go back to your code where it said it was dying, which was on line seven of that shop controller. And it's it's I think it's already up there, right? Isn't that the first tab? The first tab on the left. Yeah. Um uh, no. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, wherever your shop controller was. Uh, no modules is open. The yeah, it looks like you're stuck in your node modules folder. Yeah. Um, so out of take a look. If you take a look here, it says router.get test, right? Yeah. And this guy, this error message is saying, hey, something's undefined. So that should immediately make you question, okay, it's dying on line seven, and the router is being told to get something called test. Well, hold on a sec. Is test a thing? Because if it's saying that it, it, it can't effectively resolve it, like when it goes and it tries getting what, whatever it needs to route and it's trying to say push against it, that's why I was asking, well, is test a thing? Because if that came back null, like it wasn't registered, you wouldn't be able to perform any operation against it. Yeah, I had just so, used this to do some testing. I commented part of it out and I think that's where the problem yeah. came from. When I was implementing this is, the database. This is where that first rule comes across is what changed. Yeah. Uh, by the way, the, the test issue uh, or the commenting issue, if you're ever reviewing a pull request and someone has commented out code in there, reject it. I'm not, I'm not picking on you. The reason is, is that why is code commented out? If you comment it out, you don't need it anymore. This is why we have source control. <laughs> so, you know, if you're done with it, you're done with it. Get rid of it. Um, there are a few exceptions to that. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. Uh, the other thing is make sure that you don't check in uh, test code. I'm not saying that you are. But no, sure. make sure that you don't check in test code. And don't just comment out test uh, test code, leave it out, <laughs> put it somewhere else that you'll use it again, stash it, put it in our file, whatever. Um, but never check it in because it'll end up in production. Everything that you write that you didn't mean to get into production will end up in production if you check it in. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wasn't thinking about the end of the, where this will go, <laughs> having, it, having the commented out code there. Thank you. Whoops, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Cool. Hey, well, we got that. Help. We fixed that in under 10 minutes. Go team. Yeah. All right. So let me, I'm going to share my screen again. Boop, 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 boop. All right. I think I'm sharing my screen now. Yay. Campfire discussion. So, uh, Thank you for listening to me on, on part one. Lots of information there. Um, what questions do you have? If any, I've answered all of your questions. And Malcolm, is your hand just raised? I can't tell. Yeah, I just forgot to drop it. I'm trying to find where the chat window went. Where did the chat window go? Oh, there it is. Okay.
it occasionally just closes. Your open window looks like mine, Ari. <laughs> 30 or 40 at any given time. Do what? Said your open windows look a lot like mine. I got about 30 or 40 of them open at any given time. Oh, yeah. Good thing Anybody I got three. Any, any questions at all for Ari? Anything you've just been curious about? Good time to ask. Get me while I'm free. For junior developers who start in a help desk role, would App Center be something we'd use? Uh, if they've implemented it. So <laughs> App Center is generally a development tool. Uh, so I'd, I'd probably have to know more about what you mean by help desk. Um, if you're a junior developer or an intern or what have you, and you're working on code, uh, I can certainly see you having access to whatever the telemetry and analytics system would be, you know, such as App Center. Um, but if you're in support, probably not because it's a developer tool. You'd have to be on the development team to see it or have access. Um, I give people access in our organization so they can look at trends and if they see anything, they can bring it to my attention. I just give them viewer access instead of developer access so they can see trends, but they can't uh, manage builds or anything because App Center does a lot more than just telemetry. It can actually automatically send things out to like uh, Apple for you know deployment of an application or Google for the same. Uh, you know, it can it manages users, it does builds, it can do tests. Uh, so it it depends. Um, but let me think. When you're is there any entry level role where you're interfacing with the customer to try to resolve low tier issues. By low tier, do you mean like easier issues? Or are you talking Just, about like low level? Like, yeah, like the initial tickets that come in from, you know, you say, Mike, you know, you're, you're working at company A and you're using their in-house software and it crashes or whatever, or, you know, you put in your ticket and you get the initial response. You're talking to like that tier one support worker. I just imagine that's probably pretty entry level gig, but do those individuals use comparable software or like what kind of software do those people use to try to sort out those initial low tier tickets before they get escalated? Um, it depends. So first of all, it probably won't end up in your hands as a developer until it's gotten through a few layers. Um, for example, like customer issues generally don't end up in my court unless A, I see them in our diagnostics um, or B, customer service has gotten a complaint and they brought it to my team's attention. Um, I guess for customers, I'm more just thinking of the general sense. Like for, for when I worked at uh, like Liberty Mutual, you know, I was the customer in, in some respect where I was the person submitting the ticket to our inter internal team. And then we'd get to like a tier three support where it was the developer. Do they use those kind of um, like tools to resolve it? Do they have like in-house tools that you'd need to learn once you go to a company? I just trying to understand what that kind of role would be as it seems like it potential landing spot for, for first gig. Right. Um, I think it depends. I think each company is different. So there's some general well-known items out there. For example, Jira is an issue management system and it has a service desk feature where people can log their, uh, everyone in the company could go and log their bugs there. And then that can move from there into the development uh, backlog. Uh, so that might be how issues are surfaced to you, if that's what I'm understanding correctly. Um, there's also Azure DevOps ADO. Uh, that's another ticket tracking system. Uh, and then there's any number of other ticket tracking systems. Uh, there's Zendesk, which is really customer service based. Um, there's probably some translation that would have to occur before the customer service issue turned into a uh, development 
team task just because those two aren't connected and they ask for different information. Um, it depends though, like you said, you know, if it was an internal app, they might not be using Zendesk, um, but they may still be using Zendesk, open a ticket and then communicate with the development manager who will then create the ticket and communicate back and forth with uh, uh, customer service or help desk. So in this okay. case, I'd say that there's, there's more than one, there's different types of help desk, like help desk itself mm -hmm. needs to be defined. So there's IT help desk, there's development help desk, there's um, you know, maybe customer help desk. And I would imagine that customer issues would end up at the IT help desk. The IT help desk would talk with, would send something to the developer help desk mm -hmm. and then they would communicate that way. So how you would end up eventually getting the ticket as a junior developer, um, I'm not sure that they would have you manning the, the tickets. I okay. think what they would have you doing is the, the ticket would end up in the backlog and then in a sprint, and then you would get the work done. Oh, okay. That, that makes sense. So before it ended up, I think all the process, all the, the pomp and circumstance that gets the ticket into the backlog or into the queue of things to get done, as a junior developer, you're likely going to be shielded from that. Cool. Okay. Thank you for that. That's management That's and process and boring stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, that's prioritization, etc. I think, you know, just in the, in the beginning, you're going to be a code monkey, you know? <laughs> no, that makes uh, total sense. That's, that's actually preferable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> get some experience. I, mean, I, like, I like the whole code monkey thing. Sometimes, you know, like I remember, uh, uh, you know, last year, you know, for, for a number of years, I worked over at being, um, I worked over at Valorum and, when I was going, when I was coming on board, they asked me if I wanted to be the manager of software engineering. Um, and I said, no. They said, are you sure? I said, yeah, I need to stay out of management for a few years and just get back to my roots of being a software engineer. Cause it was, it, being a software engineer is fun. Like you're always doing something and like all the, the management stuff can be a, just, it's, it's a lot of overhead, you know? <laughs> It's not, it's, it can be doing what you love, but sometimes it's not. And it depends what kind of organization you're going into. So uh, I did that for a, a few years over there. And that was, it was just kind of nice. Sometimes I would just go work on stuff. I ended up becoming technical team lead anyway and <laughs> doing all that. You know, you, you can't escape it, but it's nice, you know, like just writing code, fixing bugs. You know, being able to get into your your uh, your zone, that feels good. <laughs> uh, let's see. So yeah, it yeah, Ra Raquel, it it is really nice to get shielded from the boring stuff. Yeah, you know, it can be a lot of fun. Like you know, there's so many different dynamics between the vendors and all the different teams, and like taking their priorities and kind of putting that together into a plan that then the team executes, and then they feel that, you know, they have what they need to go forward and then you ship product, which is, you know, one of the greatest feelings. Uh, that's, that's the fun part of my role, you know, is I get to bring all that stuff together. Um, I, I, I still write code from time to time. Uh, like I write tools and stuff that I don't want to have to go and find a vendor. It's I'm like perfectly capable of writing all this stuff, you know, most of the stuff myself, but that that's unrealistic. But the good news is, is that it helps me translate to the teams what we need uh, so that I don't waste anybody's time, which is useful. Uh, let's see. It seems like that would be an ideal way to get some early experience for sure. Yeah. Um, so one thing that would be fun if you can get access to it, uh, your first job being in a, like a consulting business, because uh, they'll put you on a lot of different projects. Um, and you know, I mean, yeah, the, the, you're in a business to make money. Um, that's what consulting is. You know, you're just selling your time, um, and your skill set. That's, that's the one thing you have to sell. Uh, but there's so many different opportunities in a consulting business, especially if they're like a midsize and up, um, that you'll, you'll probably never get bored, but then 
an issue that you could run into is that maybe you want to be committed to a particular product. Yeah. And that's not what consulting is. So you may find yourself moving to a product-based company to go do the work, or you'll be at a company that works on a product and you start believing in it and they want to hire you and it's a good marriage. And then, you know, you end up going over to that company, but the consulting firms can be a good stepping stone into uh, those types of careers. Uh, any other questions? Hey Ari, is it okay with you yeah. if the folks in the workshop find you on LinkedIn in case they think of a question later? They can maybe fire it over. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Here I'll put my I'll put my LinkedIn thing. Do, do, do. Great. And thank you so much for joining us today. I think this was just chock full of awesome information, especially that little thing that I didn't know on that setting. That's the biggest thing I tell. <laughs> That's not. See where's my profile? There we go. And then if you wouldn't mind, um, if you could shoot me over your deck, and then I will combine that with the recording of the workshop today and distribute that out to the instructors so everybody in the class can get that. You can look for that early this coming week at the latest, I would say. Yeah. Um, so if, it, I mean, I'll, I'll end up connecting with you on LinkedIn. It might be good to notify me that you were, you're from EFA, because sometimes I don't see it. And I've been burned before where I go and I, I'm like, oh, the, I, they have some friends in common with me. I'll go and I'll go and accept them. And then like within 10 seconds, I have like a, a marketing message. Yeah, I'm like, ah, and then I, un, I unfollow them and un disconnect from them before they can go and talk with everybody else I know. And it's just like, yeah. <laughs> so knowing that you're from EFA, especially if there's 40 of you, uh, might help. Um, sure. Best way to reach me, email. 